Hello. Hello. Where are you? I'm Dan Terra. I'm the Quebec Cinema Programmer here at ZIF. And I hope you enjoy Cranks. Uh, welcoming back Ryan McKenna to the stage. Uh, Ryan, uh, there's two, there's your art. Yeah, back here. Director back uh, here did in the Bahia. Art in Bahia. Did We'd like to invite you on up, you up front. Up? So I guess my first question to you would be, um, so there was uh, extensive work in researching and going through all these archives, and I was wondering if you could talk about that, uh, first part of the question, and then the second part is, we were talking before, uh, during the film, that uh, wondering how you decided to uh, meld the two together with the fictional parts, with uh, the radio uh, transmissions and melding it together. Yeah, yeah so for sure. Um, <clears throat> Peter Warren, who was the radio host who you heard his voice many times, um, when he moved away from Winnipeg in 2000, he left behind a giant archive of stuff that he collected and had amassed over 30 years. And I was going through it and I came across these letters that were called the Crank Letters. And I read them and I was pretty fascinated with them. So I, I, I selected, you know, six of them that I thought were interesting or six characters from the, the letters. And then I uh, wrote little stories for each character based on the archival letter that I had found. Um, so that was kind of the, the genesis for the, 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 the individual stories. And then I had, um, I wrote a script with six different characters and different portraits I wanted to film. And then after we had filmed them, I started going uh, through the radio archives and picking archival radio clips that I thought would work with the different stories and then kind of intuitively blending them all together. Excellent. And you have uh, part of your crew here. Maybe we could uh, discuss how how was the dynamic like creating these worlds and between you and, and your art director Rebecca. Like, what was the process and like how would you work together yeah. to create these little tableaus? Well, it's very interesting working with Brian McKenna because he has specific he has lists of like tableaus that he wants to do, like you know, the rock sucker, for example, or the, the woman who licks the plate, or all these strange actions that he's pictured. Another one example would be the person who was cutting the dog hair and turning it into a weird, like, statue. That was something that I think he talked about for seven years, like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really want I I to have a guy who here. does dog haircuts <laughs> And makes it into a statue, and that was, and then so like this was the film that that happened on. So I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like it, I, I think th the way that it worked specifically, this was we the riffing. Well, you can continue, but it was riffing off something that we had done called Controversies, which was a short film, uh, and that film we had done on quite a low budget, and we had actually like called a bunch of people at Christmas time in Winnipeg and said like hey, can we come take a picture of you? It'll take 15 minutes. And we showed up at their houses and raided their closets and did something similar to this. Uh, and that was kind of the beginning point. And so it was a mixture. And then we did a few days in studio, a few days, you know. So uh, there is some other studio stuff that I would touch on after if there is time, but which was a good process. But well, you, will, you continue if you want. No, just re you reminded me of the the rocks and um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Like the, your art department team, like uh, I remember one of your art department people, Gwen. I just said, I need some rocks, and she said, What are they for? I said, Oh, well, I just I think a character should be sucking on a rock in this scene, and she's like, Okay, I got you, and she didn't <laughs> then question it. So that was kind of fun. So yeah, yeah Winnipeg yeah. people are weird. What what part of the process did Ryan already had you in mind for for <laughs> one of the roles in the in the um, this one? Uh, oh, well, I, um, I actually saw somewhere <laughs> online that they were making a movie in Winnipeg, and I'm from <laughs> Winnipeg, and I was like, can I be in it? <laughs> and then he was like, yeah, I <laughs> can. Yeah. So I asked. We went to yeah, no, that's yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we do we know, know each, each other, other. Yeah. and uh, yeah. I am an actor. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know that that is true because it was like a, <laughs> it was a the the whole idea was a, it's kind of like a photo album, and so 
I was, there were six <laughs> characters, six main characters, and then a bunch of photos, uh, photo album type images, and I was shooting each character one at a time kind of thing, kind of like a photo project. And so there were upcoming characters, like we didn't just shoot this in one block like you would traditionally with a drama. Yeah. It was like each each section we was its own little yeah. block. Shoot over for a week, take shoot, a week off. Yeah, take a week off and collect the art department and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I yeah, the whole idea from the get-go was to make it more of a, a, a photo photo project rather than a, than a traditional dramatic film. And so did the archives influence what you had scripted or vice versa or how did that? Yeah, definitely the archives uh, were the starting point for uh, the stories, but then the actors were also an influence. So like Louis Negan, one of the stories, you know, he, he, he's one of Guy Madden's main actors. So he, he always would come uh, to Winnipeg and he would, uh, we became friends in Montreal and he would tell me all these hilarious stories about coming to Winnipeg to work for Guy Madden and one of the stories he told me was that he had gone home with this guy and that he was going to hook up with him but the guy had a potbelly pig <laughs> and he was so disgusted that he ran out of the apartment and I just thought it would be fun to kind of document, reenact, re recreate <laughs> with some, of, some of the <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and he's always had kind of had a crush on our, our friend Rankin, who's the guy in the film, so he thought it would be fun to play out <laughs> Clearly. Uh, any questions in the audience? Any comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, Ryan, I don't know if you remember me. Yeah, Bernie. Hi. Yeah, yeah, so I did a little bit of BG in the film. But uh, anyway, so I was living in Winnipeg at the time. I'm here now. Uh, great job. It uh, certainly reminds me of Winnipeg a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, love the reference to things like and old Dutch <laughs> we had a sponsorship, yeah, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I actually grew up uh, during Peter Warren's reign of terror, you know, and uh, kind of ran that, that the city during that period of time. And I love the use of his words, you know, memo and controversy and, and all those kind of things. And um, Fletcher did a really good job. So uh, thanks, thanks for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Don't be shy. <laughs> They're here for you. <laughs> so why 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 did you decide to I guess uh, shoot it in Winnipeg because you're from Winnipeg but you live in Montreal now and was it something natural to go back to uh, in in that respect or? Well, it's just yeah. I mean, I was interested in the archive and I I kind of initially wanted to shoot it in Montreal just because. I, I, I live there and I, I, I like staying there, but uh, uh, I just, it felt wrong to, to, to make it in Montreal just because, uh, uh, I mean, I shot part of it, those scenes with Louis, because he lives in Montreal and he's nine years old, so I didn't, I didn't want to fly him out to Winnipeg, but otherwise everything else was shot in Winnipeg, just because I just felt like it was correct for this particular story. Any other questions, comments? There's one thing that I would add, which was, this was maybe just an interesting tidbit, which was how a, a, a process of how we worked also on controversies, but it also transferred to this, which was the day that we shot in that Mennonite, uh, the, uh, it's like a frippery, which is like essentially a value village. So we had scouted uh, for, it, it was essentially, we needed like an 80s, uh, kind of bedroom set for that the scene where he's shooting grapefruits and uh, we found this spot that was great for it but it was this 3,000 or 4,000 square foot space full of vintage furniture and vintage stuff and instead of going in there and shooting a scene we decided oh let's just go and shoot like an entire day there and so we made a bunch of other portraits that we could figure out within that space and so we brought in walls and we had like a whole art department team and we had a bunch of we just like invited a bunch of our friends to show up and say like, okay, we had a list of his kind of uh, portraits that he wanted to do in tableaus. And then we kind of said, okay, this person's doing this, that person's doing that. And then when everyone showed up, we would, we would send everyone off in different directions to go get furniture and all the things. And we, would, we, did, we did like a, probably like 20 portraits at least that day. So that was just like another interesting tidbit of how we shot it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, also I think the script, I think the original script was 150 pages, and obviously there's not much dialogue there, but I, I thought it would be more like a, a traditional drama initially, and then I just kind of wanted to uh, cut back all the dialogue and just work in the archival radio. It just, it just became more of a documentary fiction fusion for me as I was making it. Uh, it just kind of, I just kind of fell in love with the archives and just wanted to make the film about that a little bit more. So, uh, so yeah. And I love the fact that you, uh, during the film, you can clearly drift in and out, listen to the radio, uh, look at what's going on, yeah. look at the uh, characters listening to the radio. Yeah. So the characters are sort of like, uh, you could say like part of the, the spectator as well. So there's something very interesting where it's very open and you can... Absolutely, yeah. The, 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 that was, yeah, exactly. That was part of the intention was to abstract the narrative somewhat. Like there is a story, but you can kind of follow it or not. Um, and it's kind of like the radio itself. It's kind of background. I, I kind of like that idea of, um, of taking something that was so ephemeral and just kind of making a piece of art out of it. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, uh, there's sort of like we were talking about before. Like, there's sort of this anger, and like, there's loneliness. There's all kinds of thematics as well in in the film. And you were even like relating it to Trump at some point. Yeah, no, I just, I guess I was. Yeah, it, that's true. Like, I was, I was getting a, a little overwhelmed by like, you know, the rise of you know. Trumpism and all this anger, and I was trying to kind of pinpoint it, and kind of thinking about kind of the conservative uh, attitudes in the city that I grew up in, and started thinking about like different facets of loneliness and isolation and anger and stuff like that. That's all very present in that radio archive. I mean, it's a question of how far you go with it, like how much. Like I, I think the film's a little bit funny, and I kind of don't put too much of the actual hatred into the film, but uh, it's definitely there, and it's definitely kind of hinted at in, in a lot of areas. Any other questions? Yeah. Was the set in many different parts of Winnipeg? Yeah, it's, it's kind of all over the city, so um, uh, at, that, at the time, like, when, when that show was on, I, th I think it was something like 90% of the city was, like, listening to that show. It was the predominant show, so it was a pretty pretty conservative show, and it, it's like everyone listened to it, or at least my grandparents' generation more so than my parents' generation. But it was it was it was the dominant the dominant sound of the city, and it was everywhere. And it's like what I grew up with, like in the background, um, and so and Winnipeg is a very isolated uh, isolated city, and and uh, I just kind of wanted to create that feeling of isolation and these characters trying to um, distract themselves from their problems uh, through this radio show and focusing mm, you know, their anger at something that maybe wasn't what was actually causing their, their, their life problems. So that was the idea. Yes, gentlemen there. You used mostly local actors from the area and it was a little bit different than what you used before. Yeah. Uh, Predominantly local actors. We flew in a few people from Toronto for the, the main roles, like the Hia. Uh, but mostly it was just locals. And um, my friend Darcy, who is uh, a casting uh, director, or he has a he has an acting school. He just he introduced me to everyone. And uh, and like I said, it was more like a photo project. So we shot it over like a year. Um, uh, it wasn't too rushed. Yeah, um, there's kind of been like two strains of like image systems for Winnipeg, in my opinion. There's been kind of the Guy Madden strain of fantastic, fantastic, phantasmagorical type images, and then there's been kind of the more NFT route of like a, a, a film, uh, filmmaker and photographer like John Paskovich. So that was definitely a point of reference for me was his black and white photos and the way he tried to frame the city and uh, 
and give it kind of an austere, um, stark, stark beauty to it. Uh, so that was definitely a point of reference. I don't know if you want to add something. Well, also having Gwen Tourneau and Mike Marinick, and a lot of Winnipeggers who are very, uh, have amazing collections of things on board, literally bringing stuff like, oh, I have this weird phone, I have this strange sweater, and like literally just people showing up with this incredible stuff. We didn't have a huge budget, and so it was literally a lot of people showing up with, oh, I have this thing, I have that thing, and and uh, you know, Gwen is an incredible, uh, she was an incredible collaborator on this, for sure. Yeah. A final question or a comment? say again, um, Peter Warren had so much power in the city during that time that when municipal problems couldn't be solved, people would often say, we want you to call Peter Warren. Right? That, they always throw that out there. Yeah, that is a good, that is a good comment. It was kind of like the, it was kind of like the, the, the internet. People would call him if they wanted to know how to file their taxes or <laughs> how much postage cost or whatever. He was like he was considered this all-knowing person, and he was very arrogant about it, um, uh, which is kind of funny. <laughs> but it is like you call him. Now we use Google, but yeah, he was the Google. Of the, that's why I said it was kind of for me. It's kind of an origin story to troll culture. Like these are kind of the early trolls. Um, so yeah. The Google this year. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.